Arab protesters in their time of need for all of their anti-Americanism and disappointment in the U.S., they still look to the U.S. for moral leadership. This is At Brookings, a weekly in-depth look at issues behind the news. This week, in the wake of the Arab awakening, should the U.S. revamp its foreign policy in the Middle East? The cry for democratic rule launched the Arab awakening more than one year ago and continues to shape movements and new governments in the Middle East. So what do these changes mean for U.S. foreign policy in the region? Senior fellow Shadi Hamid examines the issue, and he says it's time for a new way of doing things. There's a big debate now about what should America's role in the Middle East be? Should we be more active, less active? Um, should we intervene? And of course, Libya sets a precedent there for military intervention. I mean, my own view on that is the Obama administration hasn't really taken full advantage of the Arab Spring. I think this was really an opportunity for the U.S. to undo the past decades of support for autocratic regimes and get it right this time and support the aspirations of the Arab people in a more consistent fashion. Well, what obligation do we have to these countries, Shadi? Let's look at the countries that are already undergoing transitions and making sure we do the right thing there, that we provide the necessary support. Egypt, in my view, is still, it's the heart of the Arab world, and people are going to look to Egypt and say, is this a model that's working? Is Egypt moving towards democracy? And pe people are trying to learn lessons from that experience. So Egypt is absolutely vital, and I'm worried that even there, the U.S. isn't engaging to the extent that it should. But we have, we, we have to develop a new kind of partnership with Egypt, with the Egyptian people, and we have to make sure we're constantly engaged, and also leading an international coalition to provide the necessary funding, loans, and investment to make sure the Egyptian economy gets back on track. Because if it doesn't, that's going to undermine the prospects of the transition. It's all intertwined now. You can't separate the economic from the political. We have to look at it in a more holistic fashion. So as much as what's going on in Syria is, is a priority now, we can't lose sight of the fact that Egypt and Tunisia are undergoing their own challenging transitions and the international community has to be there. The U.S. has had a presence in the Middle East for decades, but very often supporting autocrats, despots, questionable regimes. There are some critics who say it's time to just leave the region altogether. What do you think about that? There's bad intervention and there's good intervention. I think what we did for the last five decades before the Arab Spring was bad intervention, where we supported autocratic regimes with billions of dollars. We prov provided them their military equipment. We essentially found ways to sustain their rule, even though we knew they were re repressing their own people. Um, I think now we have to go in the other direction, good intervention, which means intervening but on the side of democracy, supporting civil society, um, using our funds to help these countries rebuild their economies in a time of transition. That's, I think, what the U.S. and its allies can do right now. Well, Shadi, tell me about Islamist parties and their emerging strength in the region. How will this new power influence U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East? I know there's a lot, there's a lot of alarm, alarmism in Washington and in the U.S. in general about what does the rise of Islamists mean, for example, for Israel's security or for counterterrorism cooperation. There's still this sense that is this really good for U.S. interests, or is there such thing as too much democracy? But most important takeaway is we have to learn to live with a political Islam. We have to find a way to engage them. And um, that's going to be a key challenge going forward. When a country intervenes on another country's behalf, Shadi, very often the intervening country has to stick around and help maintain the peace. Iraq is a very good example of that. Now, the Syrian rebellion, is asking for U.S. help today, but will they want the U.S. in their country tomorrow? People are not looking for occupation, and I think that's the lesson from the Iraq war. We're not going to do that again, but there is an important, let's, let's say there's a military intervention in Syria. There is going to be a need for peacekeeping troops, for some kind of multinational stabilization force. 
So in some cases, there is going to have to be a presence, but it should never be a unilateral U.S. effort. I think that's what we learned from Iraq, that there has to be buy-in for the region. And I think what's really interesting about Syria now is that Arabs are more enthusiastic about American military intervention than Americans are. I mean, you have the Syrian National Council saying, we want the U.S. to be more involved and support the establishment of safe zones, for example, or a no-fly zone or something like that. But there isn't any desire, as far as, as, you know, as far as we can tell so far, for the Obama administration to move in that direction. So I think it's, it's been almost completely reversed from Iraq, where no Arabs wanted us to invade Iraq. It was very much a U.S. effort. We created we created it, we followed through with it, and we owned it afterwards. But I think now we're seeing a shift in a different direction. Arguably, a really strong Middle East foreign policy is important for the United States. But could it be that the American people are a little war-weary? There's American public opinion, but they also respond to what the administration says. So I think if the, if the Obama administration came in and said, this is why our vital interests are engaged. This is why we have to do more. And let's have a national conversation about it. I think people would respond to that. But the case has to be made. Stay up to date with the latest research, learn about Brookings events, and search our directory of experts, all from your mobile device. To download Brookings for your BlackBerry, Android, iPhone, or iPad, go to brookings.edu mobile.